Checking in again, State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy is here on uh, the week before Thanksgiving, Tacky. Yeah, Joe, it's who knew it was this quick uh, to the end of a month. Uh, feels like it's been a lifetime since Election Day. I know. I thought we maybe would get uh, some Thanksgiving Day recipes from Tacky today. <laughs> well, the man from the family is Rock of Lamb again. So. Oh, okay. All right. It takes, uh, I have a whole prep process to try to get the gamey out of the lamb. And uh, my mom's family from Connecticut cannot come on the 30th because we generally do Thanksgiving after Thanksgiving, which we have like five days of prep, including Thanksgiving Day for prep, which is kind of funny. Um, but we're actually doing something else on Saturday, which I have not been informed exactly how Saturday is going to work out yet. So oh, it's going to be a surprise. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be a surprise what I got to do. So unfortunately, um, there's some really wonderful things happening in the city, including uh, Interfaith Social Services working with United Way on Saturday morning at uh, Interfaith uh, on Adams Street to uh, do some turkey and supply giveaway to needing families. And uh, great work that they do along with the Norfolk County uh, Central Norfolk County Central Labor Council, uh, which is the regional union here that's an AFI affiliate, um, AFI affiliate, they will uh, be there helping out. And regretfully, because of my mom's um, unclearness of what we're doing on, on Saturday, exactly, uh, I will not be able to participate. Oh, darn. We'll take some pictures and we'll talk about it afterwards. <laughs> Folks, even I am submissive to my mother's desires. Uh, aren't we all <laughs> yes uh thankfully people are very understanding of that particularly around the holiday season when i can't do something because mom says so that's all the reason you need exactly <laughs> she's also 80 now she had her birthday in october we talked about this in the past and um you know you guys all know it's whatever it takes to make her happy yeah so today we're talking uh on a rainy day for a change which is good news actually yeah, about two months. I didn't realize those forest fires going in the Blue Hills uh, because I left my house. I doesn't know that I live in Blacks Creek and Walston, and the air blows. I didn't, you know, I'm becoming increasingly sensitive to particulates, and I'm fine indoors. But once I leave the house, I start coughing. Yeah, it's about I, a fifty acre fire, about fifty percent contained right now. Yeah, I didn't realize. I honestly I did not realize I was I was this sensitive to particulates, um, especially this level of exposure. Um, and, you know, it's not like you can smell the forest fires, but it doesn't mean you, you can't, the particulars aren't in the air. So, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll get an inch, but I don't think the forecast is getting an inch, but ideally an inch of rain would help. And unfortunately for everybody, keep an eye on your storm drains. Uh, the dry weather uh, does not always help your soil uh, absorb quickly. Mm. Um, and uh, you will get a lot of early runoff before the soil starts to adopt, uh, you know, taking it in. And if you see, you know, obviously it's leaves enough. If you see leaves near a storm drain, you know, get a broom if you'd be so kind and just, you know, just move some of the leaves out of the way and, and let the storm drains do their job. Yeah, you'll be helping yourself too uh, by doing that because uh, you could end up flooding your own property. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, um, you know, we've got a real problem, obviously, called DBW's emergency hotline. And uh, reminder folks that the drains in Quincy go straight to the ocean. So, you know, we've always... For decades now, remind folks and promote the fact that do not put any kind of waste or chemicals into this drainage system. Absolutely. Yep. It's um, verboten for sure. And I know we talked last week about uh, some money that uh, was in the economic bond bill to dredge Quincy Bay. Yes. Yes. And, you know, we still got to get the money out of the governor's office as one step at a time. But the authorization is there. We have some time period to get our hands on it. And, um, you know, this is a long process. Uh, to get done it's it's not really kind of a you know one and done deal you still got to face the money down and get the authorization and and you know get the moving uh on it uh, and inside the existing bond cap the state does limit how much of bonds and we do actually have a debt ceiling uh, which is by the way much smaller than the feds in case you're wanting ratio to the size of your budget um it's very modest uh i'm trying to remember what the number is because the number actually moves to cpi so mm -hmm. every goes up slightly, but it, it's got to be about 20-ish billion dollars. You know, against the GDP of an economy, that's almost 900 billion. That's significantly... Pennies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the feds are looking at 133% of GDP. Right. Right. I mean, it took 20 billion against 900 billion. It's not even close to um, a sizable percentage of the GDP. 
Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see what happens with that. Mm. So let's hope for inch of rain. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for a lot of reasons to relieve the drought. Just today, actually, the uh, drought monitor expanded to include just most of Massachusetts now in a critical drought stage. So it's one step below emergency. Yeah, and, and you know, we get our water from the quad, man. Uh, and most people don't realize that let's hope for snow, too, this winter, especially not on the East Coast, but in Western Mass, because the snowpack is actually very, very important for our water supply. And those communities or wells and towns has been so dry. Uh, you know, there's water uh, alerts in, in some of those communities regarding uh, the fact that, you know, your wells have been running dry. This has been so no rain. And then you also got some reservoir problems on a regional level. So, yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've, we've always seen weather uh, dry warnings during the hot summers, but I don't remember the last time there was a water shortage warning at this scale in terms of volume of communities in the fall. Yeah, no, I agree. I think especially in November, it's usually, you know, wet, cold, damp, never, never a problem with too much water. <laughs> yeah, who would know we'd be begging for cold, wet, damp right now? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you don't have to have the steak go up in flames. Yeah, we don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last week, I remember you mentioned that you wanted to mention uh, you were, had a visit from a, a Japanese official. Is that right? Yeah, uh, the Japanese constant change. Heads, uh, the consulates around here average lifetime is every three years. So, as part of my job, believe it or not, is a bit of diplomatic relations uh, because uh, Massachusetts is a major trading partner to basically the planet. And I think uh, most people at home don't realize our role in the gl global economy. Uh, Boston, despite being a very small city, is very small actually compared to other cities at 700,000 people is a international world-renowned city. Most everybody knows where Boston is in the business community in other countries, as well as the diplomatic corps. And we have about almost 50-ish, um, if you count the honorary council generals, which are formal council generals, they're not actually paid by the government, work on behalf of them on a voluntary basis. And we have about 50-ish council generals stationed inside Boston, serving not just Massachusetts, but generally either the six New England states, or it'll be regional up to Point could potentially you know fifteen plus states depending on the size of the government. So uh, yeah, new Japanese consulate uh, came in did a, a a kind of a welcome meeting at his home. I try to remember his name is Takagashi, Consul General Takagashi, I believe. Um, and that um, uh, actually I'm back there in December. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a business group from the Gassi uh, Chamber of Commerce. I believe, and I've got to do some homework before I go go visit these folks because it's always good to do your homework before you visit anybody um, to give a sense of what the potential conversation may be. And uh, they're actually having a very uh, fun thing um, that you should visit the Jarvis Council website, particularly if you've got time in Boston, is that every uh, other Friday, they're going to use the Japanese consulate office at the Federal Reserve Building for cultural uh, education, as well as discussions about everything from the economy to the climate, uh, to education, to cultural exchange. Uh, they're, gonna, they're putting up a, um, what do they call it? They're putting up a, a open to the public kind of thing. So if you're in Boston and you're interested in not just necessarily Japanese culture, but also you know, uh, international conversation, you know, definitely visit the Japanese Council website uh, this week. Uh, is uh, they sent me a notice about um, Japanese uh, opera. Uh, they uh, they have their own um, uh, concert, not opera, concert. Um, great, my brain's leaving me on this one. Right. But I mean, you know, they, they like that they have their own music okay. uh, conversation right. this week. So, you know, it's I think it's a great way of outreach. I think it's very important uh, for us to try to find new ways, not necessarily just reach out to um, the expats, but also to um, the general public at large. So, yeah, you know, I fully support these kind of programs. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I've walked by that the Federal Reserve building a bazillion times, but I've never actually been inside. It actually is a gorgeous building inside. The Federal Reserve is actually incredible. Every time I go to a meeting there, it's, it's always actually a great experience. To be honest with you. I referred to going to all the offices, how the other half lives. Ah, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you offer the stand as duct tape holding carpet together, I mean, just saying. Well, it's an old building. <laughs> it's an old building. 
Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, you know, it's, they housed uh, the Japanese consulate there. Actually, I think the British consulate's office is on Beacon Hill. Um, the Korean consulate is actually in Newton over the expressway, right? And that, um, I'm sorry, over the turnpike. We have that turnpike turn off. Mm -hmm. Newton and Watertown, uh, the Korean consulate's located there. Um, actually, you have a consulate located in Park Colony. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I think the Kiverdian consulate, and I'm trying to think of other ones actually located um, in Park Colony. Oh, interesting. Okay. Might be a little special feature to do one day, feature consulates in Quincy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You'd be surprised how many uh, little uh, consulates there. I mean, obviously, they're looking for affordable office space. Mm. Uh, one is an industrialized, wealthy country, and but they need their representation uh, somewhere. Uh, not Again, it's an international city, and there's international residents here, and they do trade with us, and they host uh, meetings and conversations and World Boston is actually a not for profit that um, does like a once a year host of all the consulates uh, to visit Boston. I've gone to a couple of these and uh, they also host conversations about world affairs uh, at a local level. So you'd be surprised. I mean, you know, I have people that come out of uh, college asking for advice about international affairs and they'll want to get into this kind of like non-state department level and like yeah. do more um, uh, engagement uh, on, on international affairs in places like diplomacy well, type uh, activities yeah yeah well boston for example is a not-for-profit um there's no shortage of came chamber of commerce related jobs that are interested in certain consulates actually hire locals so for example the korean consulate uh hires folks uh, that uh he either come from uh immigrated from korea uh, to the u.s uh, or uh, people that are directly uh, from Korea. They actually mm -hmm. have a dating shift. The Taiwanese government is the same way. I know they're not in every country, but the Economic Trade Office does that. The Quebecian uh, Trade Office is a mix. They have people hired locally and have people hired uh, internationally uh, from home country. Same thing with the Japanese. They have a, first, for, uh, a certain number of staff that come with the Consul General. And have a certain number of staff that is hired locally. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of my interns actually... Uh, actually made it into the Quebecian consulate, Quincy kid, and then uh, now working for the Canadian consulate. Interesting. Okay. Is it another interview opportunity? <laughs> it's kind of interesting, actually. I mean, uh, as we know, Paul Salucci was uh, in Quebec, <laughs> the ambassador there. Yeah, Quebec, uh, yeah, Canadian ambassador in Ottawa. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, you can do it. I mean, in this area, I mean, it's not like being in New York or DC, uh, which are much more right. national cities. But you know, I have an intern that figured it out, and uh, and yeah, I mean, it really is that simple. He figured out how to work his way into international jobs, and even though it's not a U.S. international job, I mean, you know, working for the Canadian consulate is not exactly a, a threatening place, and it's also convenient. Because Canada is like there, so when he does hosting trips, so you may have recalled that Mayor Wu uh, was in Canada. Oh, I didn't know that. She was in Toronto because they hosted Mayor Tong from, I believe her name's Tong, from Toronto to Boston. Oh, and they, oh okay. He, he he was he says he, he actually helped put that trip together. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, they're just up the street, Canada, so you know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so these kind of like. Trade relations and international changes, even with a country close to us, uh, is still very important. So, mm. again, a Quincy kid, you want to have a new interview opportunity, I can give you a name later. Yeah, thanks, Tacky. Appreciate the tips. <laughs> uh, so, economic bond bill done. What about the energy bill? Did that also get done? That got done last night, too. Okay. So, that was signed to law, we believe. The Globe had a little bit of a confusing story if you read the Globe. Didn't. Who, yeah, it was very confusing who knew what because the Globe made it sound like the governor's office and the Secretary of Energy's office was kind of a disconnect. So it was a little bit confusing story in the Globe, but in my understanding, it has also been signed to law. My understanding, there's been no vetoes. So oh, okay. unless I get that could change tomorrow or later today, whatever is filed to clerk. My understanding, the, she vetoed only one thing in the econ dev bill regarding uh, towing. Uh, chain, rate changes to effective date that needs to be adjusted, uh, which is not a big deal. And then right. in the environmental bond that's been, uh, I'm sorry, the economic development, sorry, a little tired. Energy. Energy, yeah. All E's. 
uh, <laughs> economic energy environments. Uh, the energy bond, uh, energy bill didn't have many changes. I mean, the, as I said before, the big thing with the energy bill is the siting component. Yeah. There's a little bit of a trade off here of Connecticut for them to buy some wind, we'll buy some nuclear off of them. Um, and uh, you know, some expansion opportunities for other low or no carbon producing energy. Okay. All right. Anything else outstanding that needs to be done before the end of the year? No, at this stage of the game, I'm going to tell you guys right now, certain bills are not going to make it out. I'm, I have almost no hope for an opiate uh, bill to come up regarding substance abuse issues. Mm. I really don't see them too, too far important. Uh, they'll probably be taking up sometime early half of next year. When we come okay. back. Uh, healthcare is actually three different kinds of bills regarding uh, drugs um, and hospitals and um, insurance. And we have like three different kinds of bills floating around on that stuff. And it's it became a little bit complicated because all three touch each other. I see. So I suspect that that's not going to make it out. It's too many moving parts. And the House said it's far, too di- too, far, far too different in philosophy about how to address the health care issues. So I suspect, again, that will probably be addressed sometime in the first half of next year. And this is all contingent on the Speaker and the Senate President making appointments. So if you see the Speaker, feel free to appoint me if you care to, Joe. Um, even though he's a Quincy guy and he's our friend, I mean, his job is to manage the House, not my personal feelings. <laughs> not like he doesn't care about me. He does. It's, but I mean, I do understand and respect the fact that his job is to manage the House. So uh, we'll see what the assignments look like. And uh, we talked about this. I mean, I had the list of open assignments. Uh, yes. Chairs and vice chairs. So he's got a lot of uh, decisions to make on the shuffle. Yeah, a lot of leadership uh, positions open for sure. But if I see him, Tacky, I'll put his feet to the fire just for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, you know, take it to the task. Right? <laughs> but I jest. I jest. Uh, of course. Yeah. I don't think Ron's watching this. Let's hope not. But uh yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, I think that's the setup for the um, chairs do kind of reflect uh, the decisions of both branches on what direction you want to go in. I will tell you, I'm doubtful to be a major change in healthcare finance. John Lawn, actually my classmate from Watertown's done a pretty great job on holding things together uh, on healthcare. And I'm doubtful Ron's going to change that one. But transportation chair is up. And it's the first time transportation chair has been up for People don't remember the last transportation chair. I think it was Joe Wagner, and I think that was almost 20 years ago. Wow, okay. So yeah. Bill Strauss has had that chair for a very long time. And, you know, it's a tasty chair for some members who want to try to do some transportation issues, especially in a regional level. It's not, people think, oh, it's great in constituent service in the level. It's really regional thinking. It's transportation crosses cities and towns, lines. So, you know, that, that's what's out there. Education, tasty community. People think they can change education in a heartbeat. But I mean, you know, very complicated issue, a lot of work involved. Um, yeah, especially now with um, the change in the MCAS, um, that'll be a big one. Yep, education committee is going to be charged to try to figure it out. Right. So labor and workforce, another important committee. Again, the Uber issue regarding ride share organizations probably going up in labor and workforce. That is a vacant chair currently in the in the House. So you know, in the Senate, just because the chairs now where they are doesn't mean they're going to stay there. I mean, when you next talk to John Keen, and he'll tell you. That, but I'm going to tell you too, you know, just because you're a chair there now, it doesn't mean you won't be a shop. Right. Yeah. So it's Karen Spilka is the Senate president. So we'll see that for, I've never actually spoken with her. So that may be put on my list too. Well, we have two things in common. I've never actually had a conversation with the Senate president. Okay. But people tend to forget. I remember when she showed up in the Senate for the first time and I worked for Michael Morrissey because she replaced David Minani, who left midstream in a, in a special election scenario. So Sometimes people forget. I remember they, when they showed up and where they been. <laughs> that tacky, he's been around. Look out for him. He knows. <laughs> I remember not everything, but I remember a few things. Uh, <laughs> it, it comes in handy. Institutional knowledge can come in handy. And, you know, I tell a lot of stories, as you can tell from these podcasts over many years now, enjoy telling stories, but I also tell a lot of stories to new newly electeds. And uh, sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're not. But I mean, the story is a lesson in itself because it's kind of how we teach people things. I tell you the story, I tell you a story, and then, you know, that's the lesson in itself, a story. So, yeah, I mean, it, you, you can't move forward unless you know uh, if you, you know what happened in the past. Mm, yeah. And, you know, like I said, knowing how things work, you know, doesn't hurt. And they said, I'm, I will observe. One of my colleagues mentioned to me that, you know, while I've most spent most of my life in government, actually all my adult life working in government, 
Um, and, you know, I wish I could have traveled more. I wish I could have done some other things differently in terms of like getting out and seeing the world more. As I'm trying to, as I get older, I like to see the world more because I think you learn more from seeing things that have nothing to do with you and be educated by, by exposure. Yes. Um, you know, I do observe. Yes. Yeah. Well, what's the saying? The cure for ignorance is travel. Yeah. You know, it's learning how other lives work. I mean, I love tourist sites, but I also love sitting at malls or shopping mm -hmm. or street markets or whatever, and just seeing how people live. Um, and you learn a lot. And then, you know, you sometimes pick up random kinds of conversation and tra travel. All of us have picked up random conversation. And, you know, people want to be talking to them talk. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, think about if a visitor here were to go, you know, to say a historic site, the, the Adams National Park, for instance, um, you, you know what you're going to expect, but you want to go to, I don't know, Sasha Plaza, you're going to get a whole different experience. <laughs> no, 100% correct. Uh, and I think that's kind of the, the thing. I, I People may know I like to visit someplace more than once because the first time it gets like learning to lay of the land. Mm -hmm. Second time you go, and I know lay the land, it's a little easier to get around. Yeah. Uh, I know we like to talk about the economy on this podcast sometimes. Um, what do you think is going on now with the, the economy? Well, the macro data still can still be very confusing uh, because the, a lot of it's in kind of peculiar conflict. And uh, as we talked many times now, the macro data Main Street doesn't connect. People uh, don't see the macro data actually helping them at this kitchen table level. And uh, I and you are feeling it. I mean, we've talked about this a lot, you know, that we both talk about grocery bills for Pete's sakes on a regular basis here, right? So, you know, it's intriguing because gas prices continue to decline. Um, we have, that means we have an over, either we have a shortage of usage or we have an oversupply. Mm. I'm going to bet it's really an oversupply of yeah. fuels. I mean, we're, we're using, you know, we could, we are pumping and refining way too much oil and gas, which is driving the price down, which is good for you and me. Um, and it's good for reducing the cost of transport of goods. So that should help stabilize some of those inflationary costs. Should hopefully help. Uh, but the GDP is projected to be near 3%. Uh, today's economic indicators have shown that we're still seemingly in a negative growth, uh, even though the GDP is up. So mm. this the indicators don't make any sense. Uh, and uh, consumer confidence is low, but October was a bumper shopping month. That's the bizarre disparity but that's going on right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and core PCE is kind of starting to get sticky, just under 3%. So it's probably going to stay that 27 to 3% zone. You know, it's still trying to fight its way to 2%. As well as conventional CPI, consumer price index stuff, is mm. still sticky between that same range, just trying to get stay under that 3% zone. Wages have really stagnated now. It's at 0.4% growth year after year. Now, mind you, it's year after year, not month after month. So yeah. it's, yeah. it's, again, how you look at this information does matter. Um, but you know, we're sitting on an economy that's approaching $28 trillion GDP nationally. Um, that means the Massachusetts economy is growing relatively similar pace, uh, and places are hiring as government and healthcare, um, mm. or retiring or leaving and for better money or whatever. And but there's also a shortage in those areas. And Massachusetts healthcare is a big part of our economy. Yes, yeah. And uh, travel's up, but retail's down. Travel has not really been totally killed off. People still traveling. People driving, flying. But, you know, you see retailers having a tough time. Target, Target's terrible uh, numbers this week, right? Um, if you like Target, you're going to find that they're going to be doing some serious cost cutting going to, the, going to Christmas. And certain places will be doing better than others because different social economics. And they, you know, again, the, the middle class and lower, going down to the lower classes of income, you know, suffer the most in an inflationary environment. So... You know, what are things going on? I think we're still in this real mixed signals where, you know, things are tough to meet on, on costs. I do think the new administration's biggest priority in the short run is trying to manage inflation and bring down costs without destroying the economy. Um, they always talk about lowering interest rates, which creates more access to capital. Uh, but then again, you, you have more access to capital. It also creates inflationary situations. Exactly. Yeah. There's no now you have more competition for lesser less available items, which drives up price. Right. 
But I mean, home today's data on um, first time home buyers is down. The average is 40%. First time home buyers, now you're down to 27%. Yeah, wow. Okay. That's a significant drop. Yeah. And on a national level, rotation of homes is four months. Well, 4.2, but about four months is the rotation. So it's still very low rotation. Yeah. Interest rates are floating on 7% of the 30 year mortgage. Yep. Yeah. You know, I suspect even the rates go down, you might get to a mortgage rate still about between 5.75 and 6% in the long term. And yeah. a lot in the bond market. Yeah, just they're, they're standing individually. And it, it, there doesn't seem to be a, a general flow. No, because generally when you have you know, low home sales, it's a sign of economy declining. Right. And jobs, you know, I'll be shocked if we get anywhere close 5% unemployment. I mean, I think we, we may top out at 4.3 on a national level. Yeah. And the state's always 1% lower than the national number on the general, generally speaking, on a good economy. So it's, it's you know, maximum employment for purposes of Massachusetts, that's considered maximum employment. Mm-hmm. You know, you rotate. People don't stay on unemployment forever. Mm-hmm. They can rotate in and in, rotate in and out, which means that as soon as you get someone out of a job for whatever reason, someone else just found a new job, which is why the number stays steady. Yeah. Right? So, you know, it's it's really confusing. Um and I think retail is going to have a hard time. I think they're going to do massive cut slashes on prices on Black Friday. They're going to do massive slashes on prices on Christmas. I think they're going to say it's quote unquote a record number of sales again. But when you start mm-hmm. factoring the the price cuts and they're competing against Walmart and Amazon, not just brick and mortar. I mean Macy's is competing against Walmart, and Amazon. They have a digital presence. Best Buy has a digital presence. They're competing against Walmart. Target has a digital presence. They're competing against Walmart and Amazon too. So you got all these other co- you know companies that we consider you know brick and mortar, but they already have a digital presence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? They're doing a price competition as well against other you know the conventional online. And Walmart has become a major online player in terms mm-hmm. of, of purchasing items. So you know I think it's going to be quote unquote record sales, but I think those numbers are going to be somewhat deceptive against the cost against the sales you have to put up to get shoppers to come and then. The next big one is um I didn't I keep forgetting this exists uh, Travel Tuesday. Travel Tuesday, first I've heard of that. Yeah, it's Black Friday, Cyber Monday, followed by Travel Tuesday. Oh, and Small Business Saturday too. Don't forget Small Business Saturday. So going to Thanksgiving, um, you have four major events trying to promote uh, economic growth and travel aid, travel sites and airlines and hotels will do massive sales digitally. Mm-hmm on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Oh, I did that first I've ever heard of that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's been really talked about the trend because that that's part of the economy as well. That's been really important. And but even, you know, things that are considered budget, like Spirit Airlines is going bankrupt. I know. Yeah. I it's a I hear terrible things about the airline. Is that right? Yeah, but still, I mean a major airline, because they do go to a lot of places, is going bankrupt. And you know, the Biden administration blocked a JetBlue Spirit merger. Right. Uh, this is kind of the things I fault the Biden administration on is that you now basically cost consumers a lot of routes uh, because you didn't let Spirit merge with JetBlue. Mm, yeah. I know they were afraid of a monopoly, I guess, but here's the result. Here's the result. Consumers are going to get hurt in the end for the prevention of a merger because these routes are going to be abandoned because – airlines do not keep spare planes lying around because, you know, suddenly a route opens up. I mean, every plane has to be on the move or, or being in repair or maintenance. Yeah, you don't make money on a plane sitting on the tarmac, yeah. That's correct. Plane, there's no such thing as plane in storage. So I'm not sure what's going to happen there. It doesn't affect us per se up here in the sense that it affects us economically, but it does affect us because it affects your ability to travel to particularly southern and Midwest states. Right, or them to come here. Yeah, and it's budget. It's relatively budget, meaning it's really cheap. I mean, you're taking some sacrifices on a cheaper airline. So we'll see if they're going to come out of bankruptcy or not. Um, and was, and now they're in bankruptcy. It's kind of less incentive when the other airlines want to buy them. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's, they, they lost their value. Yeah. So the Trump administration is going to have to deal with this kind of, you know, this real legit crisis uh, on transportation regarding a death of an airline. Hmm. It's very, it's really just, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's really still hasn't come back to quote unquote normal since the pandemic. Well, you we also got used to very low interest rates, right? You know, for, for since the 08 financial crisis, the Fed Reserve had been keeping interest rates under 1%. We got comfortable with that. Yeah, your bank account was horrific because you had no interest in your bank account. CDs were 
terrible. Bonds were terrible. But you had a very strong stock market. You had a lot of small business opening up. You had a lot of innovation business opening up. Like all biotech is high risk, small businesses, small research. But they actually had like revolving, revolving credit with almost no interest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Credit line was incredible. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank's an example of that. They were a low interest Silicon Valley targeted bank that works towards not just you know the Googles of the world, but also entrepreneurial small tech companies use them, but for lines of credit to keep it to keep them to keep them uh, solvent. Right. Um, as they kind of try to find new money, you know, they had to borrow money to keep the operation going, but it wouldn't have near zero interest rates. It's almost almost free. And then inflation was relatively low. Uh, mm-hmm. Because wages, those of us remember, wages didn't move because my 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 pay is tied to your pay. Actually, yeah. I'm to the medium household income, so I had six years of no movement. It really came down to it: two years decline, one year no movement, and one year barely moves. Basically, eight years of like my money not moving either. Right, and, <laughs> and, right, but but also, it didn't have to really because the cost of living was was steady. Yeah, cost of living wasn't moving either because right. your even your wages weren't flying. Right. Cost of living wasn't even flying. Other than housing, which everyone felt the pinch, a post financial crisis in particular. Yeah, uh, you know your your general cost for an insurance was relatively good. Energy prices were stable, relatively speaking. Food prices were fairly stable. So yeah, you weren't making a ton of money, but you also weren't like your cost wasn't really moving that much either. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, this was right up to two thousand eighteen. Uh, throw it to Obama administration mm-hmm. and into the um, uh, uh, people get enough. People don't give Obama's administration enough credit. No, Obama administration. Yeah, he actually said that recently. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it is so true. I mean, he navigated two major recessions and put us in a very stable economic environment, uh, making very tough decisions. Very tough decisions to preserve jobs, especially the car industry represents. When you look at the car industry, the big three, you know. Yeah, the manufacturing is what people think about, but it's like almost like five to seven percent of all jobs in the country is tied to the car industry, even though they're not in a manufacturing plant because of the trickle effect they have on a, on a natural level. Right. So, I mean, he did a lot of tough calls that panned out right up to the Trump beginning of the Trump administration, who actually was riding this really, really good situation where you could, like I said last time out, tariffs is a sales tax by the federal government for its taxes on your goods. But inflation was so low, interest rates were low, wages were steady, but not growing out of control, that you could you could weather this federal tariffs on, on your particularly, a lot of those on low-end products in agriculture. I mean, things like chocolate and vanilla were kind of crazy, but mm-hmm. for the most part, your day-to-day items was not badly inflicted, affected. And then you hit COVID, and then we, we felt the shortages there, and things got nuts. And then we came out of COVID and everything stabilized for half a blink and then it stopped stabilizing. Um, and everything's, oh, the economy completely became nonsense in terms of traditional economic Yeah, yeah. And then throughout the Biden administration, he stuck with hyperinflation. Yeah. Um, and the Federal Reserve you know, hadn't had to deal with this since the, since the dot-com boom back mm-hmm. in the 90s in particular. And then they were like flipping rates a little too quickly back and forth because they were having problems trying to figure out how to balance this out. And the stock market responded to that. And you know, if you're in a financial crisis in your retirement age, if you're listening to this, uh, you know, you had you had this really ugly decision because your your your, your retirement fund got completely destroyed. Your four hundred one k destroyed during the financial crisis, and then you had stagnated stock market for a few years. Without you know, until you had some real growth around two thousand fifteen, you finally got your pension. If our retirement fund back to like where it was before the just making up for losses, yeah, yeah, and then you hit 2022 in the first half, it was all gangbusters. That was the time to get out if you're retirement age, right? Before it crashed again, now it's all gangbusters again. They just couldn't, you couldn't predict this, right? You can't predict the stock market, right? Right, and you can't discount the international pressures too, you know, in Ukraine and Israel. Yeah, I mean, Ukraine uh, in Israel in particular affects oil prices, but you yeah. look at the gas prices, you look at the cost of home heating oil, I mean, it's not low, it's like not pre-pandemic low, no. but I mean, we're we're staying at like $4 a gallon at one point yep. in Massachusetts, like $8 a gallon in California, right? Home heating yep. oil was tipping over like $3.50 a gallon. I mean, you know, that was a triggered effect from from, from the uh, Ukraine war, a trigger effect from um, 
from uh, the, the the Gaza war, right? There's there's all these effects, and it's still going on. The Houthis are still shooting at ships in the Red Sea. Just because it isn't the news doesn't mean it's not happening, right? Right. Yeah. So I mean, some reason somehow we're stabilized, and the Biden administration doesn't get enough effort, credit because the environmentalists are I'm angry at Biden because of the fact that he, you know, drill baby drill is actually a Biden thing believe it or not, and he fracked completely, fracking incredibly. If you're anti-fracking, you know, you should hate the Biden administration. And, you know, he, you know, reactivated the oil refineries, basically had them do maximum capacity. And, you know, we're now the biggest fossil fuel exporter on the planet. We export more fossil fuels and natural gas in particular on yes. a small scale. We do- yeah, you opened up the petroleum reserves as well a couple of times, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have we are the single biggest producer of fossil fuels now on the planet. It's not China, it's not the Russians, it's not any country in the Middle East. And that's under the Biden administration, which has stabilized the fuel prices to try to keep inflation down or try to keep them flying more. Right. Trying to stabilize the European dependence on Russian natural gas. I mean, I've never seen a no one's ever going to ever seen a war where you're you're basically you know embargoing a trading partner that you're dependent on, which is Europe and Russia's natural gas issue. And then, again, this isn't like a hundred years ago where you're just like we're well, just blow up the pipelines and we're just going to cut everything off. It's, it's a different world we live in regarding how you respond to these um, uh, incursions in other people's countries. And, yes, you know, it's, well, it's a much more an international world now. So sure, yeah. It's globalization, right? And, you know, I think Putin miscalculated the, the level people will will take on to protect themselves from them, uh, because he figures they're just all capitulate because we're weak. Democracy is weak. People are so weak that we won't pay more for the price of freedom. I mean, he believes that. Hmm. If you believe that, you've got a problem. I'm telling you right now, if you believe that, you know, you will not pay for the price of freedom because you know you basically pay, you pay into Putin's hands. Same thing. Yeah. With, Chinese government, they would think we're so weak that we're afraid of high prices. Yeah. Well, they're living, they're still in the Cold War in their minds, you know. Well, they also have a massive unemployment. They have, you know, industrial complex really designed for mostly war. And uh, they they have uh, poor trading partners. I mean, Putin actually was probably not the best thing for the Russian economy because they were actually moving gradually to free market. And then he was trying to create the Soviet Union again by creating trade packs and limited trading partners. And that didn't work. And that's where he is now. I mean, if not for nuclear weapons, I mean, I'm just like, this is, I mean, we got North Korean troops for help for Pete. I mean, come on, Pete. I know. <laughs> You're requesting help for North Korea, which troops have never fought, never done anything. No, really, they have never been in military conflict. North Korea soldiers, today's modern North Korean army has never been in a conflict. So. Oh, not, not since the Korean War, right, in the 50s, yeah. Yeah, and the, you know, those got this new troop of 20-somethings, and the now in a foreign country doesn't speak the language and expected to do supply line and perhaps some cannon fodder, sadly, uh, for the Russian army. And, I mean, you know, no major country, military country, should need to borrow troops from other countries. Be like us asking Canada for help. <laughs> Essentially, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, not wrong. It's the same principle, right? We're going to rent troops from you. Uh, and I've, I don't remember the last time you saw a country actually became mercenary like this, because that's essentially what it is. We're paying you to use your people. Yeah, well, that goes back to the Revolutionary War when Britain used France. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just I've never, uh, I've never seen anything like this. So... You know, so I mean, there's these global push and pulls. Of course, you know, the off onshoring and onshoring includes places like Mexico and Canada. People forget Canada. Canada is actually part of American onshoring that we're going to have to deal with as well. Um, and the impacts of such. And, you know, this is the first time I've seen technology companies, you know, not just Elon Musk, but others, you know, trying to influence the uh, federal government and how they operate. And I have a very skepticism regarding uh, technology um, executives regarding how they think how they think of human beings actually it's um, kind of short short term thinking i think mostly it is silicon valley is not long term planners no uh, it never happened they're, they're all about the now but also how to perceive human beings like we talk about privacy of meta and things like that i mean oh yeah many other companies not just that one you know and how they you know frame people right mm. uh, you know, that's troubling and then you still got you know the EU that's kind of recovering 
Canada is having some issues. Mexico is now in decline because they don't know what's going to happen internationally. It's not the it's it's not immigration or migrants with Mexico. It's it's both. Will we fit as trading partners? That's the big, big question mark with Mexico. And of course, you got the China question, and you still got you know Japan and Australia and Korea. You got the Taiwan question out there, mm-hmm. um, and you know, and whether or not we're going to continue to export, you know, democratic principles, right? I mean. It's always been U.S. policy since the Cold War that would export democratic principles. You don't have to be like us exactly, but you know, we promote our, you know, we we good we we have a good way of life. We promote it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, well, India is a great example, I think. Right. India is the next world power that's coming yeah. up economically. I mean, they rapidly jumped into the top top ten GDP, which you know, they're wallowing in the twenties not that long ago. Right. Uh, the question with that country is that unlike China. And they create infrastructure quickly. One of the Chinese, right. one of the benefits of a totalitarian government is that when they need to build a power plant, they build a power. Plant. Oh, they can do it, you know, in a month. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, when when uh, U.S. companies went to China, you know, one of the problems was infrastructure. The Chinese basically paid it themselves. Were basically they had very they're very poor at the time in the 80s, but they're going to bite the bullet and. You know, receive the benefit of a workforce that can pay taxes. Communist countries do pay taxes. People have this misconception they don't. They pay taxes. So they would do a trade off, you know, giving no taxes to foreign companies. Foreign companies wouldn't have to pay a tax. And then they would build the infrastructure and then use the taxes from the workers Mm -hmm. to recover the money for the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it worked. When you have no, when you have nothing, it works. It's been proven over again. When you're a country that's literally nothing there, it works. But when you're, yeah. fully developed, well, I mean, you don't need approval from Congress or anything. You just do it. <laughs> well, there's also like no permitting, no permit. Yeah. No, so that just, too. Yeah. Right. India is not the same as China. They do have, you know, equivalent of some kind of EPA. I know yeah. it's very smoggy in the big cities, but they are working on things like that, and they have to make the place attractive. The biggest benefit of India is actually education. Mm-hmm. The urban areas are. Pretty, they have a lot of educated folks in the urban areas. Yes, oh, certainly, yes. You know, so it's a huge country, massive diversity of workforce from well educated as well as low skilled. The question is always the same with me is can they get clean water, sewer, natural gas, and, and electricity uh, built quickly? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's going to be the key for sure. I think they will. It's just going to take some time. Yeah, the question is how quickly they can move. And right. Modi is not having a stable situation. I mean, if you you know he did not win a majority government. He had a former coalition parliamentary government. You know, much to shock of everyone. And then you know he's trying to settle those border disputes. China and India have a lot of border disputes, and India is trying to play all sides. They recognize they're a big enough economy now where they can be part of the BRICS, which is the British, not the British, uh, BRICS, 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 uh, Brazil, Russia, Indian, China. Uh, South America, and then they allowed some other smaller countries in. They'll be part of that big trading block, but you know they're also part of the big, you know, G twenty mm-hmm. global trading. And then they want to be our partner, but they also want to be part of China and Russia. But they also want to build their own military complex because they don't want to be dependent on buying Chinese, U.S., and Russian weapons. Which, by the way, if you're a country buying three different weapons, means you do three different weapon systems, three different type of maintenance, with three different type of parts. This is not a great way to run a military. Yeah, very expensive at the least, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, because it's keeping the peace with the various countries that you buy from everybody. You can keep the peace, but internally, that's very ineffective in terms of maintenance. So, I mean, you know, they want to build their own military complex because it creates national security. And so, I mean, and they got so, like, you know, I don't know if you saw the strike on farm, farm uh, deregulation of farm prices. They had, to, they had to pull back on agricultural deregulation. And uh, they have a they have a ton of environmental problems, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a lot of quality to dust storms, and it's have the Kashmir question. Yeah, I, I do pay a little attention to South Asia, and then Pakistan's nuclear power next door, which is um, I never realized how poor that country was until you really look at every time a natural disaster hits. It's like wow, you you you, you need you, you're basically a subsidy country with a nuclear bomb. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and they got that to stay. They got the, always the potential of destabilization next door where their parliament's a mess. Um, so, but India is like really well positioned. Um, they have, you know, they control a major waterway. The Indian Ocean is theirs in terms of, uh, in terms of like waterway control. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and uh, they have a lot going for it. But at the end of the day, it's very simple: infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. You got yeah. infrastructure, and you got to you got economic development. Yeah, which, well, I mean, why we're seeing such an investment here in this country of infrastructure? You know, it's critical. Now, and this is a Massachusetts challenge, right? Where really sure. uh, new gas lines are not going to easily happen. You have an aging transmission system that. That actually the energy bill helps address the transmission system. Mm-hmm. Um, I, as you all know, I'm a big fan of energy efficiency, big fan of turning off the lights, big fan of better light bulbs because the less power you use, less strain it is on the grid, mm-hmm. right? And uh, it's good for your pocketbook too, right? And uh, you know anything that promotes higher electrical usage, you know, puts more stress on the grid. So yeah. not like I'm anti electric cars or heat pumps, but you have to be aware there is a price to be paid for those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. to the electrical grid. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we have our own challenges here, and not just in the eastern side, but people forget Central Mass and Western Mass have have high unemployment rates than Eastern Mass, and they need infrastructure. And even the Cape, because of COVID, has become unnecessarily four season, and they don't have four season four season infrastructure for large quantities of people because that's oh. what happened with COVID. Right. No, you don't. It's not. It was never set up that way. It's a tourist, you know, economy. And you cannot build sewer lines through wetlands. Right. And so you have, and you have limited, limited land. It's 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 peninsula. <laughs> it's a different type of environmental problem with yeah. because the nature of the environmental sensitivity makes it very difficult to build infrastructure, particularly underground infrastructure. Yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of challenges in the state regarding economic development. It all stems from better infrastructure. I mean, the speaker put into the housing bond bill, uh, MDRA water expansion mm-hmm. uh, into uh, this uh, to uh, Weymouth and Point South because you don't have water, you have no, you have no development. That's it right. Key, yeah. Yeah. We didn't survive the housing bond bill, unfortunately, conference. But it's an, again another reflection of the fact that you know you need you need water. Um, uh, isn't Attleboro? I think Attleboro's. I think it's Attleboro. I think Attleboro is trying to do a water plan of somewhere in Rhode Island. Yes, it was Attleboro. Yeah. Yeah. They, they just don't have enough water. Yeah. Uh, as the population grows and water's demand goes up, you the same thing. I mean, uh, Brockton's always had a water problem. Yeah. Uh, they're trying to, they've always been trying to work a deal out with, again, Rhode Island um, and whether they can do desalinization or not, um, which is always a talk, but it's super duper expensive. Only the wealthy mm-hmm. countries do desalinization. So, I mean, these are things that I won't say keep me up at night, but this is something that the administration has to deal with. Um, and it's a balance. Right? We have a lot of environmental concerns, which is important. Uh, we have limited space, but if we don't provide proper infrastructure, uh, you got nothing. Right, exactly. Yeah, you get, you know, it stalemates and then eventually it starts to retrograde. That's right. It, once, once you have a stagnant economy, there's nowhere to go down. Right. Yeah. And you're looking at China now, they've stagnated. They're they're in, they need to figure out how to deal with it. I mean, they're not last economic stimulus package proposal uh of uh I think one point four trillion dollars mm-hmm. US dollars was just to pay off, help pay the debts for the regional governments. Mm-hmm. They hide their national debt in the regional governments and they discovered this was unattainable. Um and regional governments have almost no uh, autonomy. Uh, so they kind of like have to do what Beijing tells them. And, Right. It's bad decisions. They have to live with the consequences. Right. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, but that doesn't create economic stimulus. Stimulus no. is money in you and my pocket creates economic stimulus. Oh, so much to think about, Tacky. Let's talk about the holidays instead. For the holidays, uh, well, it's a little earlier. I don't know if we're going to talk again next week, but I mean, the city does an incredible job over Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving weekend. So, I mean, you know, if, if you love the Christmas holiday, definitely get out there. You've been seeing banners around the city for different uh, school holiday fairs uh, for people who want to go explore those things. Um, the church holiday fairs will be coming along as well in the month of December. And, um, you know, we have Pearl Harbor Day uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, there'll be a, a more of, uh, for that. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to be food blown to the holiday season very quickly. And Again, I've always... I'll say this again, the different neighborhoods in the city, as well as the city itself, does a really good job on providing family-friendly entertainment. There's some fun uh, neighborhood tree lightings, too, uh, that folks can attend, you know, uh, with their with their own neighbors, which is kind of fun. 
Yeah, I sometimes get noticed, sometimes I don't get noticed. Again, I'm not offending folks. Uh, I'm not. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you got the uh, house neck um, fire station. Uh, I suspect you're going to do the lobster trap tree lighting. Probably, yes. Which is actually pretty cool. Um, I'm waiting for my house neck bulletin. My newsletter is part of the house neck bulletin that people are interested. Uh, there's the Adam Short tree lighting, which is really just continued to that neighborhood. Uh, you have the you know, walls of uh, tree lighting across from Walls of School. Uh, you have the Squano tree lighting. Um, let's see. Quincy, Quincy Point has one. Quincy uh, Point has one. Rookery, yep. uh, obviously, City Hall has one. Yep. Um, what, I think, uh, four four used to do one. I'm not sure if they will or not. Yeah, I'm trying to think they, where they would do it. I, I don't think they do. Um, I'm trying to think where else. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of these neighborhood events that are happening around the city. So, and I encourage participation. You know. Spend some time with your neighbors in person. Yes, yes. Will we see you in the Christmas parade this year? We'll see how the weather is. Okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> my, my turn to ankle. I know I'm sounding like making excuses, but this this weather's not been good for joints. <laughs> we'll have a little cardboard cutout of you, if not. <laughs> well, you can have someone carry it just hold it in front of them. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. Part, I believe it or not, one of actually the strangest things about an elected life in the parade is other not other folks is just getting to the parade start. Oh, really? Because they already start closing everything around it. Yes, then, that's true. Then, I know. I joke you not. I have to remind the city cops who I am so I can stop and get out. Well, they're all twenty now, so they don't know you, Techie. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird thing. Yeah, they need to be old folks like us, then, then they'll know who you are. It, it's got to be. Well, yeah, I know. You're, you're reminding everybody I age, too. <laughs> uh, but no, it is a real thing. Again, it's not a complaint. It's just life. It's just life, life I live. That's right. I think people don't realize I have these kind of different challenges. Uh, and you can surmise different reasons why, but I just kind of have to like work with it. Mm, I see. Uh, right. I mean, it's not just on Beacon Hill, but you know, also... Locally in Quincy, but you know, as guys know, I do some international stuff too. So, uh, you know, playing good diplomat representing the you know, state of Massachusetts, and and also it's just it's a lot of layers. I'm telling folks regarding this job, there's so many different components. Um, and you know, I like to do the job the best I can. Some days work out, some days don't. Let's be very funny. Um, but you know, it's it's still a lot of fun, and you know, it keeps me busy. Yeah. I know uh, uh, next year Quarry is going to be having a big, uh, I think it's a 23rd anniversary, something like that. Yeah, they're actually anniversary date of incorporation is November 20th. It was yesterday. Oh, very good. Okay. So that's actually the date of incorporation. Uh, but obviously, you know, the date of incorporation, you don't, you're not tied to that. Right? Yeah. I mean, the annual dinner they do in May is kind of like an unofficial birthday party. Yep. Yep. Um, the day they, but I mean, the agency, you know, was doing surprisingly well and especially as i remind folks i helped form an agency uh right around yeah 2000 uh 2001 november right now after 9 11 uh and then you know had to get through the uh, dot com bus recession we had to figure a way to survive that as a young agency then we had to survive the financial crisis um and then try to get through covid um yeah i mean it really has grown uh, tremendously yeah it came into a lot of immediate challenges for a small not for profit yes and give a lot of credit to the board and give a lot of credit to a lot of you know actually to all the donors and volunteers to help float this thing and give it a chance to, uh, to, to grow um and under the current leadership has really uh, become a, a new type of service agency mm -hmm. um changing the economic model of just stricken strictly brick and mortar Mm -hmm. Yes, great. Yep, exactly. It's expanded now. It's Rhode Island, uh, New York City, too. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's all, again, it's moving away from the conventional brick and mortar human services. And I think that's that's forward thinking and novel thinking. Yep. And uh, there's always be a space for brick and mortar, but, you know, the philosophy of bringing services to people and, uh, you know, getting people jobs, jobs, jobs. I mean, helping mm -hmm. a job creates a degree of independence. And then we, Maybe in a low wage job that needs some human services to to help support them, but you know you provide the human services and a job, you know they eventually leave the human services and they grow. It's a start, right? Exactly, it gives people a start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at the end of the hour again. No, quickly, time's fries. Talking. 
other countries and Beacon Hill and Christmas parties. The economy, Texas <laughs> Thanksgiving Day tradition, everything. Yeah. <laughs> Thanksgiving Day menu will be more reviewed next week. <laughs> uh, you know, and then you know, the holidays and Christmas will be here, here before I know it. Wednesday, Christmas, Wednesday, New Year's. I know it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's gonna be a long month in a short month away. It's gonna feel very strange. And um, you know, and again, there's a lot of uh things going on around us. Um, and before you blink, you know, it's gonna be a new election cycle coming up for the municipal level. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Not a mayoral, but uh, city council and a couple of school committee seats, too. Yeah, I'm very intrigued to see how next year's going on the local level. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned for that. <laughs> I like to observe what's happening around me. But, you know, as always, I mean, you know, it's another, uh, as we get to the holidays, you know, it's you know, great to see you, Joe. And, you know, obviously you appreciate the QA TV uh, folks. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I'm always very thankful for to have a job. I mean, I think uh, some people take things for granted. And I most certainly do not. I've always been very happy to have a job. We are happy to uh, let you... Uh talk to the community it's uh, our our mission here too yeah yeah it's you know that's simple in my life thankful for relatively okay health you know have a job family's doing okay and you know and everyone around me you know all well, my friends family are doing okay right now and i think uh that's uh simple enough to be thankful for so how can folks uh link up with you well, 617-722-2370, 617-722-2370 is the number, room 42 in the State House. We are still there until the Speaker decides to move me somewhere else. But keep me there. We're room 42. Um, we actually have to plan our holiday parties, actually. The offices will have holiday parties in December. Um, you may stumble into one, if, depending when you show up. Uh, we have tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T-A-C-K-E-Y dot C-H-A-N at mahouse.gov. That's the email. I do check my emails. You all know constituent services come first, but I do read them all. Uh, we do have uh, State Representative Tacky Chan Facebook. Uh, there'll be actually some good pictures coming up. Uncle Sam's 80th birthday party, among other things. We'll be up there as well as uh, X. We use uh, at Tacky Chan at X. Uh, obviously, malegislature.gov, malegislature.gov is the state web legislature's website. Again, I always strongly encourage to use the state legislature's website. Uh, and of course, you know, we're at QA TV once a week and once every two weeks uh, talking about topics. And obviously, if you like to talk about something that I did not talk about or Joe's not talking about, you know, contact Joe. It is his show. I'm just a guest. <laughs> uh, a long-term guest and uh, the most the most the most frequent one now tacky but i like to say it's my podcast when things go well it's your podcast when things go bad all right i'll take that that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> i can live with that uh thank you so much i'm not sure about next week uh yet but if not uh please very happy healthy uh thanksgiving to you and your family oh, same to you joe and uh let's put on a little weight next week <laughs> <laughs> sounds good all right thanks tacky Oh, 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 oh,